welcome to this week's episode of This Week in Science, brought to you 10 minutes, 20 minutes later than planned because I hit the go live button, but nothing went live. So we've been doing the show without you. I'm very sorry, um, but we're here now, and I'm very glad that you're here as well. I mean, for all those things that would have been edited out of the podcast already, Rachel is probably very <laughs> thankful. So, <laughs> to remind everybody as we get into this episode, if you love the live show, you love us warts and all, this is the uh, all the stuff we talk and we do take one, take two, take three, technical glitches and all. And then our podcast editor, Rachel, goes through and tries to clean things up for our podcast. So not everything that is seen here will be in the final podcast version, or for that matter, in the final radio version that goes out to KDBS 90.3 FM in Davis. Internet is doing all right tonight. I hope your internet is treating you well as we get into our evening of intimate science discussion. Because there are some intimacies uh, oh. ahead. Grab yourself a glass of whatever your favorite beverage is, get comfortable, and get ready for the science because we are starting. For real. In three, two, this is twist this week in science episode number 905 recorded on wednesday december 14th 2022 welcome to the science monkey house don't feed the animals i'm dr kiki and tonight on the show we will fill your head with goals chaperones and snakes but first Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. It finally happened. A technology that has been 20 years away for the past 80 years is now just 20 years away. Fusion power has produced more energy than it took to produce a net gain in an experiment that one day could allow humans to use near limitless power supplies that do not produce greenhouse gases or contribute to global warming. And while this technology holds great. While it is likely to be the best long-term solution to curbing global warming, it isn't commercially viable just yet. But finally, the solution is on the horizon. Thanks to those who study nuclear science, to those who loved their classes, to the crazy teachers who wear their glasses. It's going great and it's only getting better. You're doing all right. You're making the grades. The future's so bright. We all got to wear shades here on This Week in Science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and also welcome back, Blair. And everyone out there, welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again, as we do every week, come together to discuss science news, science advancements, science fun, all of our curiosities. We're so glad that you're here to join us as we love to talk with you about all these things. But as we jump into the show, the first thing I do need to get out of the way is happy birthday to you. Oh, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Blair and Justin. Thank you. Thank happy you, Kiki. Happy birthday to you. Yes. It was Blair and Justin's birthday, both different days but one right after another. These are our December babies, and we are so glad that they are here with us. And I hope you both had a wonderful birthday. 
I did. You really you did. did. I did too. Good. And I hope that our audience has reached out with messages of bon anniversaire and whatever other wonderful, joyful messages of happy birthdayness that uh, that they can. Um, yes, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday! And what now... I want for my birthday is for everybody to buy the Twist calendar. <laughs> so that's yes. what I ask of our listeners as a birthday present. Plus, then you'll know when Justin and my birthday's and Kiki's birthday will be next year. It's it's the same date as this year, but just in case you didn't know, it's on. Yeah, there. it happens every year. It's on the <laughs> calendars. It's great. There are two options to purchase the calendars. You can download a printed version from Zazzle, which doesn't have all the holidays, the special holidays on it. But there is a PDF that you can download. High quality, good res. I might be fixing some of the dates on it because as I discovered, was informed last week, there are a few things that we missed. Yeah, yeah, we don't need to bring that one up again. That was embarrassing. I know, but if you download that one now, it'll probably be a collector's item later. I am sure of it. But anyway. Oh, man, you need to message me about that. I am very gonna, curious. We'll fix it. We got this. We'll take care of it. But the calendars, they're ready over on twist.org if you want to click <laughs> the twist.org. Go to twist.org, click on links, order the calendar of your choice. We've got some great uh, science holidays in there and maybe adding some as the days come. <sighs> But we're here to talk about science. We have lots of science yeah. news ahead. I have stories. Um, like Justin disclaimed about NIF's ignition uh, advancement and the excitement around that. But we're going to talk about that a little bit and talk about a little bit about the realities surrounding that. I also have cell control for invaders. I've got some chaperones for folding, microbial motivators, and... Mm -hmm. You know, I've also got the sixth sense. And so do you. Mm -hmm. And we're going to learn more about it. Justin, what do you have? I've got the European Un Union is writing climate checks. It has no intention of cashing, apparently. What? CLL cancer cure trial results. Just good news, Lady Fat Edition. And slime mold technology. We always. Love we brought the same the story too. Mold. I brought the. Yeah. I brought the. Uh, I brought had brought the motivation. I was working on the motivation story too. Uh, the gut microbiome one. That's gonna be. That's a fun story. I like that one. Well, then we will definitely have things. I think to it's. Talk about. I think it's my favorite story this week so far. So far from from at least what I've read. I mean, it's a bit gutsy to think that. Microbes could motivate us. Yeah. Yes, I am poorly punning. Blair, what is the in the animal corner? Oh, my goodness. Well, I have a story about uh, taboo snake organs and also uh, traveling with friends. But before that, in the short stories, I'm going to talk about microplastics and jaguars. I don't like microplastics. I do like jaguars. Let's Let's have it all, though. We're going we're gonna to put it all in here. So as we jump into the show, I want to remind you all that if you are watching live, thank you for watching live, but you can find us all over the place, wherever podca podcasts are found. We are This Week in Science, also Twists, and you can find us on your favorite platform. We stream live weekly, 8 p.m.-ish Pacific time on Wednesdays on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And we are Twist Science on Twitch. Twitter, and Instagram. But if all of this is a bit much, you can find show notes and all of this other information over at our website, twist.org, where there are also calendars. Now it's time for the science news. Okay, big science story this week. I mean, the Artemis mission landed, made it back to Earth safely. Ta-da, we went around the moon, we came back. Let's do it again now, okay. That's the big story for NASA. That's great. Um, but <laughs> for NASA, I know I'm, I'm really like but understating. We, but we <laughs> sent great. something around the moon and brought it home again. Yeah, yeah it's fine. Again, and it was fine. It's great. We did that. OK, I just mean, we used to send humans there. It's whatever. It's fine. We, no yeah. humans yet, yeah. but we're on we're on we're on path. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. It's good. Uh, 
However, the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory has announced that it has actually surpassed one of the preordained experimental endpoints for ignition. And so this is one of the important aspects of like research where when you go into a research study, you set an endpoint. When do we know that we, are, we have done what we are trying to do? And researchers a long time ago said, okay, we're gonna set a certain amount of energy output per laser energy input that we will mark as our, that's our threshold for having achieved ignition. So last year, big announcement from NIF, oh, 0.7 megajoules, blah, 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 great, we had ignition at this small amount. They had ignition, it was higher than the amount that was put in. So similar to what they did th this year, but much less. So what they did this year is that they put in 2.05 megajoules of laser light into a small mm -hmm. chamber. Lots of lasers, <laughs> like all these lasers that have been divided up and all of them con converged on a single point, the hull rum, which is the gold and other metal container that contains the deuterium that eventually we're trying to fuse together. We're getting these atoms to fuse together. So the whole room is the container that holds it all together and it gets smushed and all the atoms go, I'm going to end up smash together because of all this energy coming in and I, I'm not, I can't explode. So I might as well just fuse. So anyway, 3.15 megajoules of fusion energy came out of this particular laser shot that was performed on the 5th of December and on Tuesday yesterday as we we're recording um, a week after but uh, they yesterday they held a press conference in which the energy secretary Jennifer Granholm of the Office of Science and Technology Policy and uh, or Department of Energy and other officials from Office of Science and Technology Policy and others came through and made a big announcement saying we've done it We've achieved fusion. We put more energy in than what we got out. Mm -hmm. The thing is, <laughs> the thing is, they still haven't really gotten out. Excuse me, I had to sneeze. Uh, they still haven't really gotten out um, the full energy that was actually put in to power the lasers wait what because i thought that was the whole point of the announcement is that they got more out than they put in no uh, i mean they, they break even the even i would be happy energy the end energy of the laser fired on the whole room yes they got more energy out but there's a whole bunch wait, 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 of energy wait, wait from the grid that goes into powering mm -hmm. the laser in the first place. And so they put about 300 megajoules <laughs> <laughs> of energy in initially just to power the lasers that were then focused on the hull room, which um, ended up resulting in the three-ish mega megajoules out man i thought so. you were just gonna say it wasn't scalable this is <laughs> this is a way worse problem although i guess this maybe uh. is solved by scale because there is a point at which if you set up a grid to power lasers at a grander scale it might actually it won't it might not be one-to-one -one, right you might be able to yeah. use less energy per laser <laughs> if you do this a lot, is starting right? to sound a lot yeah. like uh step one steal underwear step three make profit what's step two bye-bye 
<laughs> exactly. So, okay. Uh, potential. So the real thing that they're trying to do is to maintain testing of our nuclear stockpile and to have achieved ignition in this perspective makes what they're doing at the National Ignition Facility very successful because they can more successfully test uh, atomic aspects of our nuclear stockpile and make sure that things are not deteriorating too much. Uh, maintain what we've got. There's a lot of testing that that goes into understanding <laughs> what we've got sitting around right now. Um, just waiting. Okay. For you. Ah, blah blah so blah that's blah, a, blah blah. Excuses. That, that's the one excuses. Deal. I want to know why it is we need a more limitless power system <laughs> to fuel <laughs> to power our li unlimited fuel system the, yes. for the future. Yes. And if it's going to be like, how did they do this? Oh, well, you know, they used the whole coal power plant right there on the nuclear facility. That, like, I'm, this is now I'm very disappointed. So what I you mean, do is I you get the, it you is disappointing. It is disappointing. No, no, no. It's not. It's yeah. not. To Look. power the fusion lasers <laughs> to then make fusion power. But here's the thing. They <laughs> did the ignition experiment, but it was not sustained. It's not right. sustained. Sustainable. This is not the kind of thing. It was. It was a single thing. It wasn't like, oh, now we have ongoing fusion mm -hmm. that can be oh, used uh -uh. to continually, like nuclear uh, plants mm -hmm. are used to do, heat water, uh, provide power. You know, do, do all the all the all these things. Additionally, um, they think that they can make it more efficient by upgrading the lasers, by creating uh, more efficient pathways, by uh, maybe making the whole realm it, it, itself more efficient. Um, but they think they can routinely one day uh, make laser pulses of 2.6 to 3 megajoules to help initiate higher gain reactions. Um, These are more words. These are more words. This, I'm still it, hearing it's, it's we've created words. a highly inefficient, unsustainable power source. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, so, so um, that point is, in the middle, though, is the thing that they needed to is proof of concept, at least, that says, hey, this works. Now they have to figure out how to make all of the rest of it work. Yeah. And the question is really with what they've got going with the laser, how much more can they push it? How much power can they actually get out of it? When you're putting in. 300 megajoules and getting three out um, is, you know, that's a, that's can, a loss. It's a loss. <laughs> and how do we end up with a gain? And so this is the first time that, you know, apparently any of these kinds of uh, ignition facilities or fusion facilities has had this kind of a gain. So mm -hmm. that is why it is so promising. But I, I honestly think when we're looking at the, uh, the things, the, the, the platforms that are going to be used in application, we're probably going to be looking at the, the Stellarators, the Tokamaks, things like Eater, um, those other plasma-based uh, fusion generators that are not necessarily limited to the supply of the fusion fuel and the specific inputs of the lasers. So I think there is going to be an interesting next couple of decades. This is, you know, it's promising, but at the same time, I, is it? it's what, what, what I, the big thing I want to keep everybody in our audience aware of is this is not yet peer reviewed. This is not published data. It probably won't get published for, you know, several months. They're not even done analyzing all the results. Mm -hmm. This is science by press release because we have a major struggle coming up with our Congress and the upcoming mm -hmm. budget debates. So there's a big, big play here. This is where science and politics and policy come very close together and it is proving usefulness. Yeah. And the media circus yeah. around this breakthrough yeah possibilities hopefulness yeah. 
Is this going to be in time to actually help us fight climate change? No, of course, no. definitely not. No. In fact, the yeah. bright spot was if we have this unlimited power source 20 years, 30 years away, all the more reason to dump uh, carbon fuels and preserve the planet. You know, keep it in yeah. good shape because we got a, you know, we got a bright future. So let's not ruin it by getting all out of shape and sickly when we get to that, that unlimited power thing. But I'm, now I'm like looking at this and like, how did they only get three jewels out of the, how many did you say? 200 and 300 something that they put into it? Mm-hmm. How did they only get three out? Like, I think that would, that's like, if somebody it told is, me, it's like, this is I'm going to give above. you 300 jewels of laser is- power and I want you to only... Be able to have, have three of it go somewhere. Like, I, I wouldn't know how to, to dampen. I wouldn't know how to lose yeah. that much energy. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, like if I just fired that at a kettle of water, I would produce <laughs> more energy than they got out of this experiment. Like, I'm yeah, they missing... got one, 1% one of the 300 megajoules from the grid. 1%. Like, if out. I went into the backyard with a magnifying glass... And a couple of <laughs> bundle of sticks, I could start, I could create more energy right there than apparently they could do without, something's not right. I don't, I don't no, quite understand. No, actually every, everything is right. They have been iterating <laughs> and they have been developing and they have been, they have been yes. making advances. Yes. They thought they could make these advances more quickly and they did not. The hope meanwhile, of, yeah. Meanwhile, meanwhile NASA, we actually went around the moon. <laughs> and like we, we launched, went around the moon and came back home. Meanwhile, you turned three hundred. A couple, couple billion dollars. Into three. No big deal. Oh, if it, no, it probably didn't even cost that. Like going around the moon was like compared to like losing two hundred and ninety nine percent of the energy that they put into the project. I know it's yeah. iterations. You're right. The breakthroughs happen in. Small and we steps need, in science. We need to giant. fund the science for the iterations or we will never mm-hmm. get to the point of the real application. It needs to happen. Mm-hmm. The dream is that one day we will see this become sustainable. We will see actual positive gain from the energy that's put in. The dream is that one day we will miniaturize these plants so they're not as big as the facility at the national ignition facility that will have smaller uh more localized plants that could be used in local regions um you know these are possibilities they are still in the future this was a significant step it's i am just underwhelmed by the need for the press circus around it and the words like breakthrough and yes endless power and the media the media circus is what is like can we just talk about the fact that they made a significant step that's great but we are nowhere near where we want it to be media doesn't live in gray areas so you know it's very (laughs) that's where that's speaking of uh media circuses and uh dreaming dream thinking the european union uh paris agreement climate targets Uh are also in this same category a study by a european economics think tank bruegel i guess is what they're called they found that uh the EU's Paris Agreement climate targets will not be met with the current fiscal policies that are in place. Oh, these many, many years after signing off. The EU had set a target of reducing greenhouse gases by 55% uh, by 2030. And that's 55% reduction from 1990 levels, which eh, we're, we're much above those right now. So it's gone the wrong way. So they wanted, their plan was to eliminate them entirely by 2050. Lead author of this, uh, this study, this, this paper, this analysis, Professor Darvis explains that the target is currently an unrealistic ambition, concluding that total green investments must be increased by 2% of GDP annually to get near this goal. Publishing in the peer-reviewed journal Climate Policy, they 
propose a European pact, a European Green Pact should be introduced involving better policies and a higher price on emissions as well as public green investments and public uh, financing and support for green, uh, for private green investments as well. If they have any hope of actually meeting their climate objectives, these green investments need to be increased significantly. They looked at national energy and climate plans of EU countries for overall climate related investments, everything in there from tax incentives to subsidies uh, that are being proposed between 2021 and 2030. Team set a proposal uh, including a green, a green golden rule that would allow green investments to be funded by deficits without counting them in any fiscal rules. So the European Union has some, uh, the United States can be like, oh, we need money. We're going to raise our debt. So we're going to just borrow from our, wherever they have, our fake money comes from. If we can just accumulate a big deficit. EU countries aren't allowed to do that under their collective uh, agreement like stuff. So there's deficit rules, expenditure rules, stuff. That they, rules that, that those countries in the European Union all have to play by. So what they're proposing is that you exclude any green investment from the fiscal rules of deficit spending. That would provide individual countries the ability to borrow money, which is, again, pretty much fake, borrow money from the future to fund the research and technologies and the investments today so that there's a future that can still make money for things that governments do, I guess. So excluding green investments from all types of fiscal rules would provide these incentives to undertake them. Additional recommendations to policymakers within this suggested fiscal pack include clearly defining what constitutes emission-reducing climate investments and monitoring the compliance. So... Less greenwashing. That's a whole perhaps? gray area. There's a <laughs> lot of greenwashing that goes on, and yeah, and so if you've got money that's being directed towards, you know, greening a green economy, sustainable energy, or sustainable land or agriculture use, and it's not, how do you know if you don't have a way? Uh, if you don't have a clear definition, and right now they kind of don't. They also say another thing you could do. And talk about, you know, saving money so that you can spend it on, on sustainable technologies. Eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. We still have these? Who's, why are we still subsidizing one of the wealthiest industries on the planet? Mm, that would be... Because people don't yeah, like high would, gas prices. Save, and gas. the high gas prices are made up. So. Yeah, so is all of this inflation, too. It's like, oh, well, yeah. now the inflation went down. What what prices went down? <clears throat> what? Nothing. None of it. It's not how that works. It only, it only goes up, regardless yeah. of where. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, this, so they got, they've gave a bunch of economic uh, things. And this is quoting uh, Darvis again. Our proposed green fiscal pact is the most promising option to address the Tension between conflicting needs of fiscal consolidation and increased green investments. So it's published in, again, Journal of Climate Policy if you want to go look at their proposal. But yeah, based on, uh, and it's not the first time we've looked at this. You know, we, we've, we've heard from people who added up all of the, the land that countries said they were going to set aside to grow trees to, you know, counter carbon. And it's, it's half the farmland of the planet, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like there's there's a lot of I, there's a lot of media circus. There's a lot of publicly good sounding things mm -hmm. that are being said. Yeah, and so many. and people are buying it and thinking that we're making progress when a lot, it looks like we're really not. At least not as quickly as we need to be. As long as they're replanting Cabernet vines up in uh, Portland and Washington, <laughs> I'm going to be totally fine working into the future. As long as what? Well, sorry, I missed it. 
last week we were talking about Chardonnay moving up into England. I was just saying, oh, yeah. that, you know, as it gets drier and, mm-hmm. uh, and hotter up in the Pacific Northwest, we could start having Cabernet vines up here. Yeah. And that would yeah. be great. I would yeah. be very happy. You know, every place is going Portland, to have Portland's the different new Napa. <laughs> could be. But oh, yeah, God. this is, it's important to define climate investments more specifically and to i mean really we have to get away from the oh look i'm planting trees isn't that great you know the the political compromise for our economy and the way that we work our economy has been this carbon trading system that everybody's so excited about but that's not all going to work so there needs there needs to be other, which um, is how all econ- need to be changes. I get why yeah. economists think this way, yes. because economists all money is fake. And how do you know? Oh, where's uh, we're out of money over here. Oh, here we'll lend you all this money. Oh, where'd that money come from? Don't worry. Don't oh, worry. Okay, spend this money. And, hey, hey, money, we're all out of money. Okay, oh, money shows up. Oh, where'd that money come from? Don't ask. It doesn't matter. Like it's <laughs> it's they're used to just moving the moving things the around. solution around, and it's so. That's not so, how pl- it's going to work this time. Planting yeah. trees isn't a bad thing. There just should be like mass mobilization of arborists in nurseries, with, with, you know, that are spanning giant. Every major warehouse should have indoor lights growing trees if they're at all serious about the two trillion trees that they plan on planting in the next 10 years or whatever like and and or and which... don't buy offsets and actually reduce your fossil fuel use would be the better thing to do but you know that's yeah. just me but it is it planting trees is going to be important because we are seeing massive die-offs in trees um news this week talked of what they're oh, calling oh, firmageddon in oregon where they have counted some hundred million acres i don't i'm i'm and I'm not looking at the story right now, so that number is yeah. probably incorrect. It's, no, it's um, huge. It's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, yeah, it's a frightening, it's a significant, number. Yeah, a, st- a staggering number of firs that are dying or dead, brown. They've done uh, surveys of Oregon from the air uh, to count the trees and see, you know, what's out there, and the fir, the fir trees are dying. Man, and that that's their whole thing. They're they're evergreens. <laughs> that's the whole thing that they do is they stay green. They're not, and they're not anymore, and they're dying. Uh. And you know, and what we've talked about before, Blair, is how trees move. But you know, yes. this is part of they're dying off here. Hopefully, they will be able to move elsewhere to survive better. But maybe they can only do that really well with human support so Mm -hmm. justin's idea can't happen fast enough otherwise yeah right yeah so maybe that is part of it maybe we do need to have organizations that involve arborists who understand ecology who understand you know ecologists who are working in different areas and say and seeing how things are changing to help things along Mm -hmm. i mean anyone who's ever built a terrarium you know what it takes to try and keep those things alive so um we have to help our planet along in that way. Give me a budget. I'll get out. Get 5,000 uh, poorly paid volunteers. Uh, we'll <laughs> set up a bunch of yurts and, and get these mobile these mobile tree seedling building plants. We'll just go. We'll just travel like Johnny Appletree traveling band. We'll just travel mm. around the country and around the world just planting Seriously. trees as we go. Well, you got to make sure you plant need? male trees and female and trees, female and trees. they're genetically... Uh, diverse so that you know they don't have a genetic bottleneck yeah 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 there's gonna be a lot of uh breeders involved in this traveling road show also we're gonna have to use local soils so that the microbes are the right thing and the, but yeah. the thing is like yeah, yeah where are you gonna get where do you get a hundred million acres of tree you could hit up every no, every what tree you do is you chop down the trees that the are doing state. you know <laughs> Oh dear! Yeah, it's just a put deep, the put the cavernay yeah. vines in. Just put the cavernay vines in now. Just it's start them. Get me, get me my cabernet. But you know, trees don't only grow by themselves. They need males and females and others. And 
Are jaguars the same? Oh yeah, turns out they're not so solitary. That's basically the whole story. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's <laughs> it, it's just you know jaguars, tigers, leopards. They're these stereotypical big wild cats that are solitary creatures. They don't like to be around other individuals, and that's their whole deal, right? Sounds well, like me. yeah. <laughs> I think you 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 share your space with some individuals. Keith. I know. I, I um, growl at them a lot. Mm, oh, that's enough. terrifying. Well, this study from the Venezuelan Institute for Scientific Research and their partners have found novel evidence of wild male jaguars forming coalitions and collaborating with each other to secure prey, improve chances of mating, and defend mm. or expand their territories. So essentially, this is just a study that demonstrates that wild cats that we consider solitary may exhibit social behaviors like some of the social cats we are aware of, like cheetahs, lions, now also these jaguars. So it just, you know, I could say a lot more things, but that's basically all this study is really telling you is this is another situation where maybe because people only ever saw one at a time, maybe because they were projecting onto these animals because they, they're like these strong, wild hunting things, right? Maybe but who, also who because they'd only been observing them during mating season mm -hmm. when it was Could be. jaguars fighting over females or, yeah. you know. Could yeah. have been young ones looking for uh, yeah. territory that are lost and so they come across humans more often. Uh, yeah. Also, this could all be new because of habitat fragmentation. I did not huh. see that mentioned in this study at all, but certainly jaguar territory is smaller than it once was. So... Is this a recent development or has it always been this way? I don't know, <laughs> but seems like we need to challenge our expectations for wild cats. I don't know. Knowing cats in general, there's a, there is a bit of socio, they, they're independent, yet they're also social. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, we need more stories like these to understand especially as we're looking at species that are potentially going to be very endangered because of habitat fragmentation and hunting and mm -hmm. other pressures. Um, you know, how are we going to allow them to survive? How do we help them? Right. Yep. Yeah. Well, what about when there's an invader? What do you do then? Uh, destroy. Ooh. Oh, you I don't know. Right, right. Normally. Okay. So our body cells, eukaryotic cells, right? We have tons of organelles that used to be invasive bacteria, but that turned oh, into guess. symbiotic bacteria. And now they're just part of our cells. It's like, hey, look, look at these cool organelles we have. How did they come about? Oh, well, they actually used to be their own living things but they got subsumed how did they get controlled how did that happen so researchers publishing in the journal current biology would describe how there are certain proteins in the flagellate control of a cell division process of bacteria and so um, as these uh, these researchers from the Institute of Microbial Cell Biology at Heinrich Hein University, Dusseldorf, um, they were specifically looking at the flagellate Angomonas denii, which has a bacterium that has only been incorporated relatively recently, as opposed to mitochondria, which our cells took up probably about one and a half to two billion years ago or chloroplasts that are involved in photosynthesis same idea like these are billions of years ago back to back these bacteria were incorporated made symbiotic and turned into eventually became organelles so what happens over time is the bacteria come in and then they're like oh i give you something you give me something maybe i don't need all the genes that i've got and so their genome gets reduced um but how did this happen the researchers looking at this particular flagellate that lives in the intestines of insects so we're talking about like multi-layered invasiveness going on here mm -hmm. yeah. 
<laughs> this is like bacteria inside of bacteria inside of bacteria. Anyway, um, what they what they found is that this particular invasive or incorpor incorporated bacterium into the flagellate was between 40 and 120 million years ago, so not as long ago. It supplies the host with vitamins and metabolites that helps the flagellate do its flagellation and everything's great, uh, great symbiosis going on. And so they wanted to find out exactly what was going on with the control of this endosymbiont, how it's not completely an organelle yet, it's still more of a symbiont. It's not completely integrated, but cell division occurs synchronously so that when the flagellate organism divides, so does this endosymbiont. So they've gotten to the, the, the larger organism has a control pattern that's able to take the smaller endosymbiont and go, you're gonna divide with me now too, and I'll take you with me. And then their babies or their split offs, you know, the budding and all the things that they do. Yeah, that's a pretty insane got interaction. Copies. Yeah. And so what they found is that there were uh, there were particular proteins that form a ring around the division site. They looked at these pro the protein com uh, composition and they found that there are a lot of proteins from the host cell that get transferred to this endosymbiont, this once invasive but now helpful bacterium. And they were to predict the function of the of two of them because they matched known protein sequences. One of them is similar to dynamin, which polymerizes contractile helical chains. And another one is peptidoglycan hydrolase, which breaks down cell walls. And so in mitochondria and chloroplasts, these dynamin like proteins, they form a ring around the organelle division site and they contract and they aid they make the fission of the organelles happen as well. And the, uh, pepti the peptidoglycan hydrolase enzyme is like, yeah, I wanna break down your cell walls and we're gonna get in there. We're squeezing you and I'm eating you and you're gonna divide whether or not you want to. And so um, what their work has basically shown is that there is this ring around these of proteins that the, uh, larger organisms have been able to take advantage of and they use it to control those invasive symbiotic cells that they want to keep and they use that they use their protein tools to control them and to help them so the so the symbiont doesn't reproduce on its own anymore no right the it's completely has... reliant on the host has yes. taken over reproduction. Yes. That's a very that's a very interesting relationship. Yeah. So the yeah. So the the symbiont is like I don't really need all these. I things don't need anymore. this now. Yeah. That sounds like a virus. It does a bit, but it yeah. But it is, it is hijacking the cellular controls, right? for reproduction but in this yeah, particular it's, case it's, one of those, it's useful it's, you just don't <laughs> yeah yeah you got this big powerhouse right next to you that's doing all this stuff anyway so then uh, whose idea is it right <laughs> like or is it just is it, is it uh, a case of just matching up is it are they related enough somehow evolutionarily that the same proteins would it, were already triggering this reproduction and so then so then when they started hanging out close together, uh, when the big one went off, it's, it did the other, the small one this, uh, as well, the Indian as well. So it's, ah, oh, yeah, it's a very interesting, how does that, how does that relationship start? How does, how does that it start? process begin? How does, and is, the, right, is that the selection pro point, process? Or is the, yeah. Yeah, at some point, they're just hanging out near each other. Eventually, one engulfs the other. And then the, the relationship begins where they're really helping each other out. And the one that's been engulfed says, I don't need these genes anymore because you're doing that. And the one that has done the engulfing 
also gets rid of a, a few genes it doesn't necessarily need anymore, but not to the same extent. Yeah. And so it, it, it's still an interesting battle of the genomes, right? If you come from the selfish gene aspect of things, if it is the genes, per, the, the genes prerogative to reproduce, which is the better strategy? All right, but it's sort of like then, uh, what are those those birds that have the other birds raise their eggs? <laughs> it's a cuckoo. <laughs> the, uh, it's cuckoo, but is it, what's the, is there, uh, there's a, a nest parasite. Yes, thank you. a brood parasite. parasite. Yes. A brood, brood parasite, parasite. yeah. Um, because and essentially too, like if you, it's also, a, it could be a strategy or a benefit to your genes to have a bigger, stronger, or a, a more efficient system uh, out there doing all of your reproduction for you. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. who's, who's being selfish and who's just being opportunistic there? Hmm. These are the yeah. interesting is questions. Is yeah. there a difference? Right? <laughs> is there a difference? These are the fascinating questions of biology, yeah. I think. Yeah. Justin, tell me about Success. some cancer cures. Take us, take us to Take us to some cures. Oh, that, works. that works. Yeah. Does it work? No. Does it okay. Work? Let's see. What do we got? Well, it takes three different drugs. Uh, they got three drug combination, which currently seems to be winning the battle against chronic lymphatic leukemia, CLL. They had a broad group of patients in a clinical trial that went into remission. Good news. Then they had a phase two clinical trial that they focused on high risk forms of the disease, ones that are going to be more aggressive and have a, uh, a, more de a quicker detrimental effect on the, on the humans. And they found that it was really effective there. And so now they're getting ready for phase three. This is out of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, the inve investigators so far, all their trials have looked amazing. The initial cohort of the trial, again, this is the any type of subtype of CLL, which is, I have that, uh, and it's, it can, and I've got like the, don't worry about it, like you're going to die of old age before, you know, CLL does anything to you, versus people who will get diagnosed and in the olden days would be dead within two or three years. It has a wide range of, of aggressives, and it depends on, uh, you know, ge some genes and chromosome differences and how, what kind of a, a disease it is. So the first one, they just, anybody, any form of CLL, and they found that this three-drug regimen, I'm not going to try to say the drugs, I'll try to say, Acala, Brutinib, Venetocalax, and Obinuduzumab. It sounds like I made that up, but that's really the name. This is a, they produced a deep remission in 89% of the participants. And the phase two, which is exclusively patients who are in the high risk CLL or the more aggressive form, they found deep remission rates of 83%. And we're talking deep remission. This is only 68 patients altogether, but what that means is in that, in that high risk group, after 35 months, they did a follow up. 83% of that, those high risk patients had undetectable disease in their blood, no detectable CLL in their bone marrow, and 45% uh, were considered complete remission, like there was no indication that they even had had it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, there are other, some other technologies that have been out. CAR-T has had similar sorts of results where it's put this cancer into complete remission. Uh, but that's a very high tech, somewhat dangerous. Uh, there've been some catastrophic small percentage where people die from it. Yeah. And, uh, and it's extremely expensive. This is, this one here is a targeted drug an antibody therapy and another targeted agent working together for uh, 16 months of use. It's produced this pretty amazing result. So this is specifically in high risk patients. So um, what? It, 
what is high risk as opposed to like is it high risk is like you're at the point where this is going to cause you to die within a certain amount of time or so high risk means that it's going to the progression of of white blood cells that are basically zombies or smeared mm -hmm. cells so that they and when is what it's going to look like in lab where they're either zombies are going to do their job but they're going to get produced in you know 10 20 times the amount that uh, a healthy individual would have that that process is going to happen really quick you're going to get a doubling mm -hmm. and a doubling and doubling within three month periods, three, six, nine, it's gonna go up very fast. Uh, and the so you're more likely not high to get risk, sick. You're more likely to get sick, you're more likely to get the immunocompromised situations happening yeah. because you're gonna have a body full of white blood cells that aren't actually working. And yeah. it's a okay. very confusing okay. part to the body and your body's not able to not even cause problems this is so it showed really high uh, it showed a really high effectiveness for even the high risk even better effectiveness for the lower risk the slower moving and after three years 93 percent of participants were alive with no advance of the disease that seven percent too now to be fair usually you don't get CLL until you're Pretty old. It's a, it's very common to be over 65 years old before this gets diagnosed. So, you know, with the average age over 65, no doubt, that 7% might have died something else. Yeah, there's other stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so they're next. And so they're going to keep applying this. They're going to uh, uh, try to apply this to other forms of CLL, maybe off of CLL and look at some other things that it might work. But so far going into phase three, nice. it's looking pretty, pretty effective. Yeah, so okay. phase three studies are usually much larger sample sizes. You're looking at, you know, big control groups and really looking at comparisons of how well it works. So that's where we'll really see if this is something that is a real, real result, right? I think it, I think it likely is just the, there's been uh you know, because I tracked this one a little bit, cause I got you, know, when you get a disease, you yeah. like look it up every once in a while and say, Hey, what's going on with, how's it going? Uh, yeah. yeah. So there's actually a bunch of treatments out there. They've really like, if this was 10 years ago, there's this and there's like a handful of other treatments that are being specifically targeted to how the CLL, which is a small spectrum of diseases that CLL, for small spectrum of causes of CLL, they've now targeted what those different causes are and they treat them differently. And it's, it's mm. almost, I'd call it an almost 100% treatable disease already but not to the point of complete remission, removal, non-detection, like this is doing. Right, so yeah. They, they, they've been able to knock it down and control it for most people uh, at this point. And, and yeah, it's lovely to see that there's, and this doesn't sound as expensive as the CAR-T one. That yeah. CAR-T <laughs> one, it sounds really expensive, yeah. but again, that, was, that one was curing people in 48 hours where they were cancer-free. So just another cancer going down, not a potential future. Maybe this is again, this is cancer cures that are on, on the scene already making their way through these trials, kicking cancer's butt left and right. Yeah. There was a, a really good result from an MRNA cancer like trial this week as well. So, um, and similar to the MRNA vaccine that we've been using for COVID, they've been studying that for treating various cancers. And there was a very promising result this week on that front also. So yeah, let's kick cancer's butt left and right. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Jews, about and, and, time. But then we got to <laughs> figure out what we're going to do. Extra people we have on the figure that out. That's a good problem to have. Yeah. So we already have two money. What's what's a few more? 
It's no big deal. Yeah. People aren't having as many kids anymore, and apparently the Y chromosome is going to disappear, even though that's very contested. But you know, huh. no worries. No worries. Birth rates are growing down all over the world. Y We're going to manage chromosome it chromosome is it's... going to disappear. Yeah, yeah. What? No, just shh. Uh, sh what? Not really gonna... This what? is a story what? that rears its head like every couple of years. And yeah, it is not... I remember seeing this before. It's silly. It's, yeah. No, the Y chromosome is not disappearing anytime soon. So Y chromosome individuals of the world do not despair. Um, however, Wait, let's talk despair? about... <laughs> don't despair. Let's talk about a really, really, really cool discovery that could give us new information as to how proteins fold. This comes out of the Department of Energy's Slack National Accelerator Laboratory, which used to be a, a linear collider. They don't do the linear collider, collider stuff so much anymore, but they do lots of high energy physics and really, really cool imagery, high, high resolution, real time imagery of proteins and cells and lots of stuff. And so this study itself is like a decade in the making because of the work that's gone into it. And the researchers um, that have been involved in this at, from the Slack Natural, National Accelerator Laboratory in Stanford University were looking at a particular machine within cells that's called TRIC, T-R-I-C, and TRIC directs the folding of tubulin. Tubulin is, oh, there goes my light, woo! <laughs> what just oh, happened? No, no. I don't know. Are you all we right? just got so excited about tubulin. You lost it. Right. Hold on one second. <laughs> one second. I'll be back. What is this? Somebody's in the chat room no. said, I heard that make go away. Do you know there's more people with red hair alive today than have ever been on the planet before? That's true about just I mean, about everything people. people watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Please. Also, like, I doubt it's going away. I It'll mean, Neanderthals were around a long time ago. They had the red hair. So this is one of those things yeah, that hopefully maybe. will be edited from the show. I think. But they had the thing about Neanderthals that people got to always remember is that they – they had a very large territory. They probably <laughs> had every kind of skin color, hair color, and eye color. They were probably just as diverse as, as, as current modern humans in that respect. Well, even more so than the fact there are still redheads now is, you know, it means it's conserved. Redheads well, very it, conserved. It, come on. Come on. Anyway, tell us about protein folding, Kiki. I'm so excited about protein folding. What yes. do these slackers so, do? You're talking about slackers. The tubulins. You're talking, talking about slackers. About... They had a linear accelerator and then they stopped using it because they're slackers. <laughs> they're like, ah, it's too hard to set it up. Let's try some but, other science. Ooh, but they've got high energy stuff. So they're like, let's look at super high, rev make high resolution movies of things that are happening inside cells. So where once upon a time you had to like freeze a section of a cell to try and get the, you know, the crystallized structure of a protein to see what it looked like and to be able to get that structure. Now they can actually start, they, they, they can take movies. They take these picture by picture, frame by frame, high resolution images. And once upon a time, the idea was, okay, you've got a chain of amino acids. The amino acids are like there in the body of the cell, right? You know, they go through the ribosome, they get turned into this chain of amino acids, and then ta da! Electromagnetic or uh, uh, electrostatic forces and other attractive forces say fold together in this way. And then the protein just can't help it. it folds together in the way that it folds together. Over the years, we have realized that there are guiding chaperone proteins, which are very creatively called chaperonins. And 
one of these chaperone proteins is called TRIC. And TRIC is the chaperone protein that is involved in, in just kind of guiding tubulin on its way to becoming the microstructural, one of the microstructural proteins inside of cells. So that it, it's like this tubulin is like, it, it makes up the scaffolding that's inside cells. And so it's a very important protein. When they went in and actually looked at it through uh, this, uh, th through the system at SLAC, being able to take these very high cryo electromagnetic um, images going back and forth between biochemical, biophysical tests, the imagery that they were able to get, they were able to determine that trick is actually like a chamber. And there are these chaperones, a lot of them are like chambers. They're like little dressing chambers, actually. And the protein, the, the amino acid chain goes into the chaperone and then the doors close. And when they come, the, when the doors open of the chaperone, the protein's there all structured the way the protein should be. And so they were like, what's happening inside the chaperone? What is happening when the doors close? So what they discovered is that inside the chamber that trick creates is that there's actually a lot of like little fibrils on the interior that are all ele electrostatically charged. And they kind of are like little helping hands that help tell the protein to go where it needs to go. And there are uh, up to about 10% of the proteins in our cells, as well as those as plants and animals, that get help from chambers like these in folding into their final states. So not all of the proteins in our, bod in our bodies do, but 10%. So mm. there's, a, there's a few of them. And so, there's an interesting aspect to this, which is what's going on inside of these, these chambers. How are the chamber, the chambers and the quote is folding spaghetti into flowers. You know, how do they, how do, <laughs> how are these chambers basically doing the, uh, helping the origami happen? And there are these little barrels and they have eight different subunits internally. They form two stacked rings. There's a long skinny strand of tubulin protein that delivers into the opening of the chamber by a helper molecule that in this article from newsmedical.net is shaped like a jellyfish. Then the chamber's lid closes, the folding happens, the lid opens, and then it comes out. They were able to determine that internally uh, the, there are four intermediate steps that occur in folding human protein tub tubulin, and they are all directed by the inner walls of the chamber that is ah. trick. One end hooks, one end of the, this amino acid chain hooks into the inner chamber. The other end attaches in another spot, and then there are folds that happen, and the folding is directed by the electrostatic charges of those little wobbly-wobbly electrostatic tails that dangle off the inner wall, and they hold and they, they nurture the protein into doing what it's supposed to do and getting where it needs to be. So the chaperone, the chaperone must be specific to a specific protein. Right. So this is an interesting question, right? So uh, the, there are a number of different sh chaperones. And the question now is, what role do these different chaperones play in things like misfolding of proteins, like those that may be responsible for Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease or Huntington's if, if disorder? A, yeah. Or what yeah. and and how can we potentially target the chaperone themselves as opposed to mutations within the amino acid chains themselves? So, 
it's a new it's a new discovery like totally new idea that um you know yes some proteins do just go i'm short i'm great i'm just gonna fold the way i want to fold but others need a little helping hand and there are yeah, within the rooms for them. construction or the assembly of a uh fold of a protein with as a strand there's little bits that are going to uh, be attracted to other bits and segments in it that's going to allow it to fold naturally right but it could get distracted bonds i mean there's it's... bonds within there's bonds within this structure that are you know designed to connect or to yeah. to attract to hold it together so where does where does the specific specificity of this I, is, is this like where does the chaperone come from? Is it getting printed off and then separated by an enzyme when the when the protein is 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 printed made by the ribosome? Is the chaperone also being printed at the same time, or because if I it's have no idea, these are great questions. Somewhere completely yeah. else. Yeah, yeah, if it's complete, if it's if it's if it's trick, somehow this, it's it's a multi. It's a it's it's a. It is itself a, a multi-part protein, yeah. right? Stacked yeah. rings that have been put together. Yeah. It's a complex protein itself. So where did it come from? Mm. Turtles all the way down. Yeah. Oh, gosh, the <laughs> human uh, or whatever. I don't even know if there's a human body. Uh, this is, uh, biology is complicated, man. <laughs> <laughs> It is. Com it's messy. Biology is complicated and messy. But um, what I think is very interesting about this is that what it probably does is because of some of the bonds that need to occur to create the tubulin protein final structure, perhaps there are energetic barriers that need to be overcome. And because of the structure of the chaperone, it's able to more easily allow the energy that's needed to uh, to be accessed. But is this is this happening in the? Where is this happening? Where is this taking place? Is this in the? This uh, is in this not the nucleus. apparatus. The, or the, no, this this is in the cell body. This is in, in the body. cell. There's nucleus cell body. floating out there. So it's already. Yeah, this is post ribosome. Yeah, but hmm. free okay. floating. Except I got a chaperone. <laughs> yeah, fascinating new ideas, though, in uh, how these proteins get folded, and also. It sounds like the, it's like sort of like the the whole the whole phrase of uh, "fix it in post" that we do when we do our live show. It's um, it's like the Rachel of biology. It's like, yeah, yeah, well, we here's the proof we made. Yeah, we didn't really put it all together in order or anything, but it's that in one particular. And then the editor comes by after is like, oh, they did it again. They did it again. All right, let's fix it. Yeah. It's Kevin Reardon, yeah, is asking, the, the good question is not how is this happening, but why is this happening this way? So, um, yeah, why did this particular system come to be? Why is it only 10% of our proteins that are chaperoned in this particular way? What is special about those particular 10% of proteins? Um, how can we use yeah. this information? And what does it mean for all of those AI programs that are like, mm -hmm. I can predict a protein structure. Yeah. Yeah. Do, 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 do. So, so yeah, the, the really fascinating question you just hit there is where's that 10 per, is that 10 percent of those proteins are they uh, what, what you would what do you call it uh, uh, they have a greater conserved longevity throughout the history of organism or are these the more newcomers yeah I mean more complex you might think is is newer but maybe this like it, oh, do the are these helpers ancient or are these helpers a mm. new thing that's come along and evolved? So folding proteins are the newest thing instead. Yeah, <laughs> Get yourself yeah. Like which ones? What, what shoelaces. came first? Shoelaces. I feel like the self folders. Tie themselves. I feel like the self folders <laughs> would actually somehow be 
Because it seems like less complicated. It seems but, very uh, less complicated. But it'd be interesting to, to track the evolution of this, too. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so very interesting discovery. A long time uh, and a lot of collaboration uh, to allow this to even happen. The advancement of technology that made this possible is... Um, one of the biggest aspects of it, like 10 years ago, we could not have yeah. made this discovery. Um, and really only four elements of it's done it. Yeah. Four elements of tweaking a, a protein to get it in the right shape. I played those folded games. You got a whole myriad of tools and pulling. If you had to do something in four moves or with four tools, it might, yeah, that'd be tough. Mm -hmm. It'd be very yeah. tough. They've done it. Wow. Blair, do I need to sing? Hmm. Do I need to sing now? So, what, singing in the microplastics? Is that what you're going to sing? It's raining microplastics. Is that like an, was that ABBA? Oh, no. 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 Anyway, it's, anyway, it's raining. <laughs> is it raining? Why is it raining microplastics? Well, and do I need an umbrella? More specifically, it's not even raining <laughs> microplastics. It's just in the air. Oh, uh, no. This is a, a study from University of Auckland. They calculated 74 metric tons of microplastics dropping out of the atmosphere onto the city annually, which is the equivalent of more than 3 million plastic bottles falling from the sky. <laughs> the, so this is not just on first... one city. Yeah. In New Zealand, not even like a, you know, crazy. It's not New York. Right. It's anyway. Um, the, the thing that's interesting about this is not that there's much microplastics in the air. This has actually been figured out before. But that their new method of measuring microplastics in the air, they think, are is more accurate and unfortunately contains way more microplastics than previously measured. So in, in, um, in previous studies, they found... Um, uh, 771... Mm, I am missing the tons no i don't know the 771 was their metric for london 275 in hamburg and 110 in paris but um this new uh metric for auckland was 4885 this is the mean number of Whoa. airborne microplastics in a square meter in a day there's that that's what it is so it is just the the base number 771 275 110 in paris so obviously auckland doesn't have 40 times as many microplastics in the air as Paris. The what's happening is the method for well, measuring you microplastics just said is it better. did. Right, so it's it's the method for measuring it is more specific and catches specifically nanoplastics which previous methods did not. And so that goes into the the measurement. Wow. And so, so of course really this tiny. means it's you know it's way worse than we thought. It's just there's well, just plastic I, everywhere. You're part plastic. That, There's no way around it at this point. It's I'm just. I I think it's a big revelation to know that plastic and microplastics are just a normal part of nature that we just didn't know about all of this time. <laughs> um. Or normal. Normal. Stop yeah. oh, using dear. plastics. They think a big part of the way that airborne microplastics end up in the air is from breaking waves. So it still originally started in the ocean in this theory, but then it ended up aerated and hangs in oh, the right. air because it's yeah. so small. Yeah. And so uh, oh. that can carry it to remote places far away from water, even though, you know, it's not wet. Um, but yeah. basically, yeah, I just wanted to let everybody know you're breathing in microplastics. There's nothing you can do about it, except we can reduce how much microplastics are in the air moving forward. So please use less plastic. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> I mean, that's really, that is really the solution. It just, can, can we, we use, use less? Much. We use too much plastic. Mm -hmm. It's too much. Can we, I feel like, can we I feel put like pressure the on half, manufacturers? I just, yeah, okay. I second feel like half. the second half of this century is going to be all about undoing the past century and yes. a half worth <laughs> yes. of damage to the planet and just it's going to be like okay we had this uh, other plans for this half a century but we're just going to spend the next 50 years cleaning we're i feel like it's really up. only the last 50 years are the are the biggest contributors to what's going on here i i feel well yeah I, they've been big i feel like 
I, I feel like, you know, we need to teach ourselves to clean up our messes. Once upon a time, plastic was the most amazing mm -hmm. advancement that was going to make Stewards. everyone's it's yeah, mm -hmm. let's make Still everyone's lives. it's revolutionized healthcare. The amount of plastic Easier. used in healthcare is insane. Can we just have them use it? Just them. I mean, yeah, we don't oh, and need science. the plastic bottles oh, and kid for, toys. Uh, water. Oh, and oh, oh yeah, water bottles. You got to have those. I really, really and, you know, love my big old in metal, a car nowadays. And then there's, metal oh, truck we just need to, childhood. Take out people's just need to learn how to slide. clean it up. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Kiki, how much of that was lead? <laughs> Shush. <laughs> what? I'm sure Let's it was just steel. Microplastics. Iron. Lead is. Definitely remember when? Yeah, remember when you used to remember. be able to take your toy car and draw on the wall yes. with. I do you remember <laughs> when you used to be able to take mercury out of the thermometer and just play with it. Yeah. Just the, play with it all day long. So we learn, and this is just part of life, right? Sometimes things are revolutionary but they're not necessarily so great. And so we need to take stock of that and accept it and move forward. Arn Laura is saying, don't forget makeup. And there was another story this week about a group of chemists who have created a uh, plant-based shiny glitter that is biodegradable. Cool. So it could be used in makeup. It could be used as glitter for parties and all sorts of things not metal based not uh plastic based very cool brand new that. kind of glitter we'll see when I'd rather and if put it makes it out but biodegradable things on my body anyway so it sign me like up yeah. as long as it, there's no allergic reaction i'm, I'm right. happy oh my goodness well this was a fun first half of the show we saw <laughs> this, so many conversations so much good news quick science news huh <laughs> quick this was the quick science news segment this is this week in science thank you so much for joining us for another episode we are really glad that you're here and while you're here please take a moment to head over to twist.org and check out our 2023 twist blair's animal corner calendars they are available through zazzle or as a uh pdf download you can print it yourself wherever you are beautiful high quality pdf that you can print wherever you are, but you got to go to Twists to be able to access it. And, you know, Blair's request, buy a calendar for her birthday. I mean, for you, for her birthday. Um, this is something that we enjoy doing every single year, and your support in this project really does help us keep doing it. And honestly, Blair's art this year is just fantastic. The Lego art is beautiful. It's lovely. You don't want to miss it. All right. Also, tell a friend wow. about twists and tell a friend about our calendars. These are things you should share. Do not keep it to yourself. Do not. This is not a secret. This is not This Week in Secrets, okay? This is This Week in Sharing. That's what we are. Okay, anyway. Back to the show. It's time for that part of the show that we do love to call, what is it called? Oh yeah, Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. What you got, Blair? I have the mystery of snake female genitalia. Number what? one, didn't know it was a mystery. Then, mm, yeah, okay, number one. Yes, let's start there, <laughs> shall we? Let's so, start there. this is based on a widespread issue in biology, human biology, and zoology where male genitalia is studied extensively <laughs> and female genitalia is not specifically Ugh. the existence of 
and the function of a clitoris on female animals. It's just not studied. So as you might imagine, I am here to tell you snakes have clitorises. And this is breaking news. Since the okay. 1800s, we've known that male lizards and snakes have a dual sex organ called a hemipenis, which is basically a, a two-headed penis. But it wasn't until in 1995 that a German herpetologist who was researching monitor lizards first described something maybe like a female sex organ on a lizard. And there's a bunch of ideas about what this could have been. Previous ideas were that um, they might have uh, be, be a scent gland because it's near the it's near the cloaca, which is where waste comes out and where um, sex organs come out or go in, depending. Um, but so it, there was an idea; it was a scent gland. There was an idea; it was just an underdeveloped version of a hemi penis, which is also what a clitoris is in a lot of ways. Anyway, um, and then they also there was also a theory that it was there to stimulate males. Oh, of course. Which is a hilarious jump to take before looking at whether there's biological signs that there's female stimulation going on with that organ. So, so this finding is, hey, looks like it's a clitoris. And in fact, it's a, it's a um, hemi-clitoris. There's two. So it, it mimics how the, oh. the hemi-peens work, right? Um, and their, all of their study makes it look like it, it works just like, or very similar to a mammal clitoris. So it has erectile tissue. It swells with blood. It has nerve bundles. And so all of that indicates tactile sensitivity and potential use in, um, sexual stimulation, which now let's talk about sexual stimulation in female animals. There are reasons for that. Um, no, there's a, they're not. <laughs> obviously, like <laughs> the base level one is it if it's pleasurable in any way, that extends the length of copulation, which extends the likelihood of fertilization and successful reproduction. So baseline, yeah. if it's not painful, <laughs> if it's actually pleasurable, then they'll keep going and they might do it again later, right? So there's there's an evolutionary reason to that being the case. But also um, there's a lot of theories about stimulation um, to females during copulation being related to lubrication, which prevents damage to female anatomy, specifically mm. from spiny hemipenes. So if they're spiny, if you have better lubrication, then you're less likely to get injured, less likely to get infected, less likely to die or have complications related to your reproduction. So there's a lot of benefits to this. There's not a lot of studies done on the clitoris in the animal kingdom or in humans. And it's, it's because this whole kind of topic of female pleasure in sex is a taboo still somehow is it, and is it's, it? Why oh, would it... it is embedded it is embedded yeah. in the history of science yes i mean just peek mm, on yeah. twitter even before a few weeks ago there were lots of people saying that it didn't exist yeah. at all <laughs> so it's you know it's still it's still a misunderstood subject and it's still a taboo subject that a lot yeah. of um well, first of, of, all, of yeah. scientists don't go looking f to do studies on these kinds of things because it's not as well respected as other particu particular things they could study, including male anatomy. So yeah. it's it's a very interesting thing. That I think this is the second or third study I've done in some way on um, on the study of the clitoris in, in animals and how it's all still very, very new. And I hope that we continue to look at it because reproduction is the basis of the mechanism of evolution and it's, it's, you know, it's like the whole it's reason propagation of species. We exist. And so, yeah. yeah so it's understanding 
one half of the story that we never talk about. We talk about, okay, so males are trying to spread their seed. It's like they're trying to get as many females pregnant as possible most of the time so they can, you know, have reproductive success. And we're talking about how females are just kind of like the receptacle <laughs> in the oven. But there's this whole other side of it that's about female pleasure in sex and, and how that is actually part of a successful species. And I can't wait to hear more. I don't know. I think I think I think that's all very secondary. Really, because uh, the one overwhelmingly consistent theme throughout is that life is not about us. It's about egg. It's all about egg. egg right, but this is exactly that. More eggs right. This is, is this is the egg. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This Protect the egg. The egg. Yeah, this protect is where the, the egg. egg is. So if if a clitoris yes. <laughs> increases the likelihood of egg getting fertilized, this is yes. key to that. I I hundred percent agree. And if it, it and if it accre- increases the likelihood of the safety of that egg yes. for any reason, yeah. that is important yeah. as well. What I all, will additionally all about making more egg. Good egg, successful make, egg. Make what happens? Egg. What happens after <laughs> egg? This whole life and drama that we play out here on planet Earth no, is oh it's interactions. It's part of and making more egg. And, yeah. it's all egg. It's all about it's egg. egg. It's uh, yeah, only I thing think, that matters. I think you're agreeing with me, Justin. You're I think I am. I know, but I, okay. I couldn't okay. just so say it. It started as an argument, but it sounded like you <laughs> actually agree with me. It's fine. No, I totally agreed with you. I just didn't want it to, you know, because we're you out didn't... here in the world of drama and everything. But it's all about egg. It's and the in, in most reality, important thing. In, and in reality, it's all about genes. So, right. Yeah. Right. And the genes that yeah. contribute to yeah. having a functioning clitoris could be a more successful gene that yes. then, yes, absolutely. That's what it's about. But reptiles. Mm-hmm. So we're not talking about mammals. No. no. This is a new family. Like this is, this yeah. in itself, I think, is yeah. massive. Yeah. So there's this, this whole idea now that squamata, lizards and snakes, they yeah. could all have them. Which, yeah. Why, why aren't we looking? They're not that small. They're The smallest ones are like a millimeter. That's We look at stuff smaller than that in biology yeah. all the time. That's yeah, we're just not you miss looking. It. You're not looking. If you're not no. looking, you don't see it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, well, I'm going to go. They- Look, I want now. I'm curious to see if they have nipples. All right. Well, they don't have those. But they don't have nipples. No. They <laughs> um, do have. Have you looked? This is where the I arms don't know. used to be. Now yes, we need they to look. Have visual limbs. Uh, yeah. But the, the, this is another reversal of a of a kind of an age old theory that a lot of animal sex is non consensual. There's there's a theory that a lot of it is kind of. Not I mean, a who wants to consensual who, thing? Who wants to be a duck? I don't want to be a duck. Right. Nope. But if we <laughs> find <laughs> out that that female ducks have a clitoris and there is stimulation happening, then there it is kind some... of flips the script a little bit. I think this is really interesting. And there's mm-hmm. this narrative that you know, sex isn't always pleasurable in the animal kingdom, which I'm sure in some cases is true. But right. it's this the existence of this structure and the need to look for this structure more and more and more it has the potential to change the narrative for how sex works in the animal kingdom and i am very excited to see what happens if there weren't if there weren't a drive if there weren't yes something that kept the i'd like to do this again you know especially for organisms that are that exist for multiple years i feel like i'm getting the talk. multiple years on end i yeah. feel like this, this is this is the, i'm finally getting the talk this yeah. is like, this is this <laughs> this is not the birds and the bees this is the snakes and the the seas the clitorises <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so anyway um moving on uh sometimes animals will move great distances for various things including 
I suppose sex. sex. But yeah. uh, when they do, when they migrate, <laughs> we we have obviously spent hours and hours and hours on this show cumulatively over the years talking about how the heck animals migrate, how they find their way, how is it possible. Lots of theories, landmarks, stars, sun, magnetic fields. New research offers a clue onto how migrating animals get to where they need to go when other signals fail, even they, if they are using. Yeah, go I know, ahead. I know what they did. They yes. didn't throw away their old like map books. Thomas's guide. The yes. Thomas guides. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So, but if you if you lost your Thomas guide. If there's a sunspot and you lost the magnetic field or there's other conflicting signals like humans, gosh, and our electronic devices. Um, Or if uh, the sun goes down and you are using the sun or the stars go down and the sun comes up and you are using the stars. (laughs) In any of those cases, you could start to lose your way. And so um, researchers wanted to do an animal model uh, to figure out if they are using multiple signals at once. That's one hypothesis. Um, the Another idea is that they are consulting their magnetic custom cu- cu- compass custom. They're consulting their magnetic compass to use um, other ways of navigating like smell or landmark. Right? So, so all of these current theories are basically like it's and. So you might have a main way of navigating, but you also use this other stuff when your main way fails. Mm-hmm. But this new hypothesis that they wanted to test was that perhaps it's because they stick together. And while one individual's sense of direction may fail, if they have others with them that still know where they're going, they can kind of lean on each other throughout the, tra- the travel, the flight, the swim, mm-hmm. wh- whatever it may be. And Uh, kind of by the law of averages, if you have a large enough group, you can always have some people that know where they're going or some animals, and then they get to their destination safely. So they created this computer model. They simulated virtual groups of migrating animals, and they analyzed how different navigation tactics affected their performance. They began their journey with a bunch of animals spread over a wide area. They encountered others along the route and started moving together. And, um, they balance between two competing impulses. One, to band together and stay with the group, or two, to head towards a specific destination. So if the group is kind of going away from where you think the destination is, what are you going to do? And then they gave everybody a degree of error. So sometimes your sense of direction is going to get messed up. Yeah. And when they simulated animals uh, where they made more mistakes regarding their magnetic map, the ones that stuck with neighbors reached their destination. Those that didn't care about staying together didn't make it. Hmm. Even when their magnetic compass sent them the wrong way, more than 70% of animals still made it home just by staying with the others in their group and following the lead. So for, this is interesting to me. So uh, on screen right now, I've got an image of monarch butterflies, which we know very well for their migratory ability. But uh, butterflies are not long-lived organisms. Right. Yeah, they don't make the whole trip. Right. And they they often, they don't make, they don't, they don't live more than a year, right? Uh-huh. So these are, these are insects that their whole purpose is fly, reproduce. You don't have mm-hmm. like birds who have potentially migrated the same route year after year after year mm-hmm. and have some memory of it. So... This is what I find very interesting is mm-hmm. how can you still have, you know, everybody's right. magnetic compass is going off. You're not, something's gotten in the way, solar flare, whatever it is. Right. How do they end up going where yeah. they are supposed to go if they've never been there before? Yeah. And I, I, was under- about I how... understand birds, but I don't understand the yeah, butterflies. I, I was thinking about how when you when you put a larger and larger and larger group of humans together and ask them questions, um, yeah. they become more and more wrong. <laughs> the more <laughs> the more humans are, there. they make worse and worse decisions. The, the oh, kind come of- on, group think it's really yes. good. I mean, yeah. it leads to riots and stuff. It's uh-huh. awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this is the opposite. Somehow, this is somebody veers off course and they're like. No, no, no. I think it's this way. We're going to keep going this way. And then it's it's somehow 
But this is the thing is that this, this is the other thing they noticed about the study is that the smaller the groups get, the worse they are at keeping course. If a hypothetical population yeah. dropped by 50%, this is similar to what monarchs have experienced in the last decade, fewer of the remaining individuals, about 37% fewer, made it to their destination. So this is really important to consider for population dynamics and impacts on migrating species. Is there a way to keep them on course knowing that they might have a harder time with a lower population? Um, yeah. But yes, you're right, Kiki. There's there's a, a mechanism here that I don't totally get other than just like there's so many of them that that they stay the course just inherently in being such a large group. It's hard. Why it doesn't really make course sense. And not another yeah. course. It doesn't yeah. make sense. So yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, I'm fascinated by this. So, I mean, we talk about groupthink and the 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 the, the you know possibility for negative behaviors, but uh, we also know that there have been uh, economic models built off of human behavior and prediction models. In fact, there are predictive betting sites where, based on surveys of large numbers of people, you can kind of you can put your money on, you know, the next election or, you know, various various aspects of what's going on in our society. And these ideas of the, the knowledge of the crowd, the wisdom of the mm -hmm. crowd have worked very well in these, in, in many situations. Yeah. Um, you know, so I wonder, this is wisdom of the crowd, but how does it come about? Why does yeah. it work? And... Yeah. I mean, is, my guess with yeah. with very little understanding Stick with me, is kid. that whatever okay. signals are failing for some individuals Aren't do not is. fail for all in that yeah. moment. And so you might have a slightly better sniffer than someone next to you. And so you can hold on to a scent cue that somebody else has lost and would veer off course. Yeah, or there, your... you have, there you have natural selection at play, right? There right, you have the, right. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah or, or your inner ear still knows where to go based on the um, the magnetic field because yours is more attuned and somebody else's goes hay haywire, right? This is what I'm guessing yeah. based on the context of this information, but um, we don't know. This needs to be tested and modeled further to really know what the mechanism is. Yeah. And I think it, you know, I'm going to guess it's different for different kinds of yes. species, but yeah. it is interesting to see that it might be something that works for generally applied across species. Mm -hmm. The wisdom yeah. of the crowds. So ask for directions is ultimately <laughs> what I would say here. Stick with me. I'll yeah, take you stick with you your need. friends. Travel with friends, or if you yeah. don't know where you're going, ask for directions. Yeah. <laughs> Someone around you probably knows. Someone might know. This is This Week in Science. Hopefully, we know things we can take you in the right direction towards. Justin, what would you like to talk about? <clears throat> I have got just good news. The Yay! science news segment that volunteers to sniff the expired milk cartons of unpopular subjects in the search of, for uncurdled outcomes, or still good enough to <laughs> use for one more day. Just, it's just good news, lady fat edition. Ladies, more so than men, tend to deposit fat on hips, buttocks, and the backs of arms so-called subcutaneous fat. While many may attempt to reduce these areas of cutting, it turns out they might not be so extra after all. As it appears, they have a protective factor against brain inflammation, reducing problems like dementia and stroke, according to this report. So males tend to get greater fat deposits around major organs inside the abdominal cavity, which is known to be far more inflammatory. And for menopause, males are much higher risk for inflammation-related problems that things like heart attack and stroke are much higher amongst men. 
Men don't have so, menopause. I mean, they before might have women, men who so, take sorry. pause, but yeah. So, before, <laughs> thank you for the clarification. Yes. So, yeah. women before menopause have much okay. lower risks of these inflammation related problems. Um, but it levels out post menopause, they catch up. Okay. And part of what also happens is fat starts to redistribute a little bit. They start to take on fat uh, deposit areas that look more like what takes place in men. And they were, in this study, they were looking at how, uh, specifically they were looking at the brain, a couple of brain regions, to learn more about how brains become inflamed. And they looked at in increases in the location of the fat, as well as levels of sex hormones, and uh, compared to brain inflammation in male versus female mice at different time intervals, as they grew fatter and fatter on a high fat diet. So since like people, female mice tend to have more subcutaneous fat and less uh, visceral fat than the, it's a reason that the distinctive fat patterns might be part of the reason for the protection from inflammation the females before menopause. So they found no indicators of brain inflammation or insulin resistance, which also increases inflammation can lead to diabetes until after these mice reached these female mice reached menopause at about 48 weeks uh, menstruation stops fat positioning in the females starts to shift becomes more like the males when they compared the impact of a high fat diet which is correlated related to uh, body-wide inflammation mice in in, in mice uh, both sexes Following surgery, similar to liposuction, to remove the subcutaneous fat, it did nothing to directly in any of the estrogens. So, so they had them on this, uh, this, this fat diet, and some of them, then they got the subcutaneous fat removed, and sex levels stayed the same. But the subcutaneous fat loss increased brain inflammation in the females without changing any of the sex hormones. So that, that shows at least a correlation between these specific fat deposits and a decrease in inflammation or a managing of it of some sort. Bottom line, female brain inflammation looked much more like the males after removing subcutaneous fat, including increased levels of classic inflammation pr promoters of certain signaling proteins. This is all according to Dr. Alexis M. Stranahan, neuroscientist at Augusta University, which is, I think, Georgia. So <clears throat> this is quoting, when we took subcutaneous fat out of the equation, all of a sudden the female brain started to exhibit inflammation the way the male brains do, and the females gained more visceral fat or the internal organ fat. It kind of shunted everything towards that other storage location. The transition occurred over about three months, which if you were to make a correlation to humans would be several years of human time. By comparison, it was only after menopause that the females who did not have subcutaneous fat removed but did still eat the high fat diet started to show brain inflammation similar to the males. So again, this is, this is tying in two different ways that they looked at this fat storage deposit rearrangement seeming to correlate with the brain inflammation. So it's uh, sounding to me like, uh, like like this is another case of it's all about egg. Because if this is happening <laughs> right up until menopause, then you're protecting the brain from inflammation when you're when you're a baby bus. It's all about egg. Basically. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We need to make sure and apparently it doesn't matter with the men. Men can uh, get inflammation, get a stroke, yeah. they can die, whatever. They don't, they don't have egg. They're not the important nope. ones. They don't have uh, egg. Interestingly, though, they, they, had, yeah. they removed subcutaneous fat from mice that they had on a separate low-fat diet. And they removed it, uh, the fat in early age. And the, they developed a little more visceral fat and a little more inflammation in, in the fat. But, but they saw no evidence of inflammation in the brain which is a little bit counter to the rest of their findings. So their, their take home message is like, don't get liposuction and then eat a high fat diet. 
Yeah, that's not going to help. Exactly. Eating yeah. Uh, yeah. moderation. Uh, others, uh, the... Moderation's key, possibly. And also, you're not a mouse. Um, yeah. You're not a mouse. But you're mm -hmm. not a mouse. But I think this also has implications for, you know, potentially the sex differences that we see in the onset Studies. of various neuro neurodegenerative diseases and other issues. And like you mentioned, stroke and, uh, and, and other issues yeah. that maybe lead to the premature deaths of men before women. And well, another reason to do it, to do separate studies studies. Yeah. So that yeah. you're not just studying, uh, inflammation in the brain in humans, <laughs> you have to separate this out to um, the the kind of hormones you have in your body to kind of indicate it might be different, right? And treatments might be different because of that. And in the meantime, while you've got it, flaunt it because it's good for your brain. Yeah. So yeah, they're they're, they're saying yeah. also pointing out in this that uh, BMI, <laughs> body mass index, is dividing weight by height, uh, which is usually uh, or commonly used to indicate if garbage overweight. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, that's basically what they're saying. It's not a very fat. meaningful. Yeah. It's tool. nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she says. She says. Uh, Stranahan, he goes on to say here, we we can't just say obesity. We have to start look talking about where the fat is, because that's the critical element here there's still a you know a lot there's a lot of correlation here it seems like not a whole lot of specifics about mechanism yeah, there's, yeah. the studies looked specifically at the hippocampus and the hypothalamus of the brain hypothalamus which controls metabolism and exhibits changes with inflammation from obesity that also helps control conditions developed body-wide as a result the center for learning memory regulated by signals associated with those pathologies but doesn't have any direct control over them their evidence indicates estrogen may not explain the protection females have at least not alone uh next they won't want to better define does and yeah uh so the good so just good news for you ladies having a hard time losing subcutaneous subcutaneous features your diet fails may actually be good for your brain might be might be pre preserving <laughs> healthy healthy life <sighs> and in other news hey you've ever had a piece of technology break like a phone or a watch or electronic mm -hmm. device like, or, or maybe it, oh, maybe it didn't break maybe just a new version came out just oh, a new version. You're like, ah, it's time to upgrade. Oh, planned obsolescence stopped working because the new version came yeah. out. <laughs> so apparently the, a lot of people, they, they throw away their old electronics. And and this is uh, leading to something like 40 million tons of electronic waste each year. With this in mind, the University of Chicago scientists made a watch that was alive. They made a watch. <laughs> A somewhat smart watch with an integrated slime mold. <laughs> the researchers created Excuse a watch me? that not only works, <laughs> that not only works, actually, sorry, they, they created a watch that only, that has a function that only works when the electrically conductive single celled slime mold is healthy and it requires the user to provide it food and care. To keep it healthy. Excuse me, I gotta <laughs> feed my watch. Yep. <laughs> Not just yeah. mind it, feed it. They then test how this uh, device affected the wearer's attitude towards the technology, and, and so yeah, they, so the watches were designed to tell time. That was uh, in, uh, by itself standalone, and then they also had a feature that measured the wearer's heart rate. But that second feature, that heart rate measuring feature, only functioned when the slime mold was healthy, well-fed, and bridging that to conductivity connection. So slime blow oh, I blob found a is picture placed... of it. This is wild. <laughs> this, are you, did you share it? I want to see that. Yeah, I'm going to. I don't have I'm the gonna. picture. 
So they tested how this uh, thing works. They took the blob and they placed it in an enclosure within the watch. User must regularly feed it a mixture of water and oats to induce its growth. Oats. <laughs> <laughs> when the, when the I slime mean, that's what I try to feed myself. Okay, <laughs> easy. <laughs> when the slime mold little for me, little for is, you. Is, is, is healthy enough and it grows and it reaches the other side of the enclosure, that's the electrical circuit that activates the heart rate monitor. So now your heart rate's being monitored with this organism. The organism can also enter a dormant state if you don't feed it. And then in that dormant state, if it can apparently be revived again after days, months, or perhaps even years later. So while this makes tech less user-friendly in some ways, it is uh, also uh, requiring the user to be more friendly towards the tech. They conducted a study with five participants who wore the watch for two weeks. Over the weeks, the users cared for the slime mold until the heart rate monitoring was enabled. And then researchers asked participants to stop feeding the organism, causing it to dry out and disrupt the heart rate function. Throughout the study, participants uh, updated journals about feelings about their device and answered questions in interviews. Researchers found a high level of attachment to the watch, with some users saying it felt like a pet. Some named it. Even putting their partners in charge of feeding the oh, watch no. when they could not. Oh, dear. That's the first thing Subject I thought. Said if, connect- if I was told to not feed my watch, it would be very hard. Yeah. to do that like, yeah no i'm gonna feed it still i love people in the chat who yeah they had uh, emotional responses yeah paul disney the tech. marked are are responding and saying this is kind of like tamagotchis the the mm-hmm. tamagotchi toys that used to be Very those much. digital pets that you'd have to feed and take yeah. care of and mm-hmm. but this is actually yeah. a piece of tech that is not just a pet, but something that can uh, work with you as a piece of useful technology. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so subjects actually said they felt a much bigger connection to this than they had uh, with, with playing with virtual pets. Like they were, uh, the emotional response when the study participants were told to neglect the organism was, were ones of guilt and grief. <sighs> We're not, we're not reading it. So the uh, the paper's published uh, in the 35th annual ACM Symposium on User Interface Software and Technology. But part of, I, I guess, the brainchild behind this, partly this is just a fun thing to do, I think. Uh, interesting experiment, social experiment kind of a thing. Uh, but kind of the idea is if you could get people to feel more attached to their or sentimentally attached to their tech maybe they'd throw it away less maybe they would go in for the repair maybe they would keep it longer well it's not if, just the repair if they thought of it it's, as a pet well it's also i mean th- as we mentioned at the beginning of this the planned obsolescence planned obsolescence aspect of things is a huge issue and if the technology is being updated in a way that makes it hard for you to continue to take care of it. I mean, that's something I, I love this idea. Yes. I think we should find ways for people to connect more with their technology in this kind of way. I think using biology and technology together is a fascinating way to make it work and perhaps it's more sustainable. I mean, if you're using components like slime mold to conduct electricity as opposed to precious metals, um, mm-hmm. you know, maybe this is this better. Is, the, the researchers, the researchers <laughs> are making no claims about practicality. Oh yeah, no, this what, is so, not. They're this not. They're not yeah. saying, "Hey, slime mold is the future of tech" in any way. What they're what but they're saying is, this. if you can yeah. build an emotional bond separate from the one way user need give me the information yeah, yeah, use yeah. my tech thing uh people like like if oh i'm not yeah i can't get rid of slimy slimy's been with me since 
Since middle school, I gotta keep my iPhone six a little longer. I gotta. Yeah. I just can't throw it out. Or, I or even if I don't use it anymore, I killed my watch. Even if I don't use my smartwatch anymore, I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna at least keep feeding it. I'll have it yeah. on the bedside, and I'll give it a little bit of water and oats, and it'll still. I don't need it for the heart monitor anymore. But you know, maybe maybe I'll pass it down to my kids, and and then the slime mold will be in the family for generations. And oh, just like yeah. that. So Eric Knapp. starter for the sourdough. Yep. And Eric Knapp is saying the 130 year old pocket watch I got from my grandfather is not getting thrown away anytime soon. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So you can pass yeah. down this. This this combination <laughs> heirloom organism and uh, tech memorabilia generationally passed down, and I don't know how long a slime mold can live. But, I was just uh, gonna ask you know. that. Well, maybe maybe it's, however, it's a long time. Maybe however long, long it continues to be fed, it's an ongoing organism, right? I have a couple of stories to bring us into the end of our show. Talk about, we're talking about slime mode, slime mode. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, maybe you might be in slime mode when you're feeling stuck to your couch and you haven't showered and you're just unmotivated to get up and exercise or do anything that would be physically challenging. And you're like, oh, I just can't get, I can't do it. I'm in slime mode. I heard there's some uh, pandemic term, I guess. It's like goblin mode or something like that. <laughs> I learned recently. Yeah. Regardless, researchers at uh, a number of universities have found that two bacterial species, Eubacterium rectale, guess where that one's found, and Coprococcus eutactus. Also uh, same. Yeah. No, same. Guess where these are found? They're found in your gut, everybody. They produce metabolites known as fatty acid amides. These fatty acid amide metabolites go on in the gut to stimulate receptors called CB1. These are cannabinoid, endocannabinoid receptors on gut-embedded sensory nerves. Guess where those gut embedded sensory nerves go? Mm. To the to the brain. Actually, they're the uh, dome. they connect to the brain via the spinal cord and in a region specifically known as the ventral striatum. They just don't they don't just go up like vagal nerve and go do 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 brain stuff. They go to a very specific area, the ventral striatum, which is important to releasing dopamine. Mm. which this all happens, this whole process, this cascade that I just talked about happens during exercise. Dopamine gets released during exercise. And in their work that was on mice, not on humans, mm. they had mice without bacteria, mice with bacteria, um, they found that mice that had these bacteria seemed to have more of a runner's high when they were exercising. More dopamine was released while they were exercising than uh, mice that did not have these bacteria. And so they're attributing the presence of certain gut bacterial species in the performance of, or the, the activity of higher act higher active animals so these so we have a we finally have a probiotic that yes. is a surefire diet mechanism it motivates the whole body to exercise to maybe do more exercise so yeah. you'll never know if you don't it's exercise the first time though right so yeah, like, but if you do and you, you go try. this is terrible then you don't have it you don't have enough of this microbiome <laughs> <laughs> So we don't know. Uh, yeah, so really they did machine learning looking at attributes of mice to see like, okay, why do we have some mice that like running more than other mice? And they really could only account for a little teeny tiny percentage of it through genetics. The genetics yeah. really were not the part that made the difference. It was bacteria. 
in the gut that made the difference to those that wanted to run and those that didn't want. So now what we don't know is, um, do we put more of these bacteria in the gut and then that leads to this pathway? So would it be the kind of thing that we could do specialized fecal transplants or you know, probiotics that somehow get into the gut to populate the gut with these bacteria? Is it something that can, um, is it that you exercise and you create an environment in your gut that allows for these populations of bi bacteria to exist in a way that mm -hmm. leads to wanting to exercise more? But regardless, we don't know if there's a pathway like this in people, but in mice, it appears that microbes motivate and yeah. maybe this so, is the the pill that we all need dr justin's not a real doctor <laughs> poo pills for what ails yet won't help you with this i don't have these metabolites <laughs> i don't have the metabolites i used oh, wait, to Justin, I... you're selling your poop i don't think i ever realized that <laughs> oh well, well i don't have where am i where am i gonna go get other people's poop that's disgusting yeah. No, I'm not going to get him to touch anybody else's poop. It, you know. Yeah. No. And it may oh not be God. it may or may not be in pill form. And there's no guarantees. Oh, but no uh, guarantees. So 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 I I this is like if I had this, I would have had this in in my youth cuz I used to run. I used to love running. I used to run like extra laps in the in the physical education classes. I did the track team and I ran. I ran and I ran and I ran. I just loved it and I wanted to keep moving. And then at some point that stopped. <laughs> you lost your bacteria. Your motivation I think I need went to, away. I think I, you know, one yeah. of the times in life where you got antibiotics or whatever, maybe it knocked it out. So I need days. So I need to somebody else's poo pills to fix <laughs> Dr. Justin's, uh, not a real doctor poo pills uh, system. Uh, because, yeah, no, this is. That's, I mean, I love the fact that they looked at, they went through and they looked at the genetics and they looked at diet and they looked at all these other things. And the only thing that trended, the only thing. The biggest, the biggest thing. That made yeah. the dip, the biggest thing that made the difference between the mouse that was out there running on the little mouse treadmill. That's what I have a picture of them all on little treadmills. And like, yeah. that's, I don't know how they. They're little running they wheels, you know, they get in there. Oh, you got the mouse out there running on the, yeah, running on the, the, the wheel. Yeah. And it's going and going and going. And the, the biggest factor that they could tell in the difference is the mice that didn't do it, they got microbiome. That's just awesome. It's fascinating. And the researchers, mm -hmm. uh, one study co-author, Jay Nicholas Beatley, uh, who's a professor, associate professor of biology at University of Pennsylvania School of Arts and Sciences, says the gut to brain motivation pathway might have evolved to connect nutrient availability and the state of the gut bacterial population to the readiness to engage in prolonged physical activity. This line of research could develop into a whole new branch of exercise physiology. You know, it's also interesting. Yeah. Is this genet because they say the genetics played only a tiny part in this. Yeah. I'm thinking about all of the professional athletes in this day and age who have two parents who were athletes. Now, you think, oh, well, eating? of course, two genetics, uh, two uh, athletic genetic, uh, you know, that's where you get another genetic athlete. Or is it the family microbiome that is microbiome. being preserved? Those, like that. Those, those are the poo pills we need. <laughs> yeah. We got to go find some athletes. It's like, I just, no, I don't want an autograph. No, actually, no, no, it's not, no. I don't need a game. I don't need no, a jersey. No. I don't need an autograph. I have a, I have a slightly different request. You seem uh, motivated to exercise. <laughs> yeah, you're always out there training and running and lifting. Yeah. I just, it's a small, small thing I, I, I need from you, but it's just, it's just about some poop. Okay. Moving on from the, uh, this, um, <laughs> This is my favorite story, though, by the way. This, this really is. Yeah, it's a great. It's, I love it. It's a great story, right? Yeah. You and you know, all earlier, those, all those athletes you, yeah. who spend a lifetime athleting, where are That's they hanging so out? Right. In the locker room, in the training, in the gym, with all where these other. They're sharing microbiome all over the place. 
So somebody in there has got the good microbiome by the end of a season of sharing tight spaces and working together and eating together and all this. They ended up sharing oh, a bunch of microbiome and then the team gets better. It's like, hey, we, we're way, way better than we were at the beginning of the year. Everybody's done a lot of work. Well, it's because that one or two people in there I had the right microbiome. It's not so CrossFit. It's not a cult. It's the microbes. Yeah, you should. Because everybody's just to get going to the CrossFit gym microbes. and they're sharing the microbes, and they're all mm -hmm. like, "Oh, now I need to come back and do more CrossFit." That's well, that's why the first it. class, if you don't have the microbe, the first couple of classes are like, "Oh, this is tough. Yeah. I can't do it." But then after you've been in there breathing their air and smelling their, uh, uh, you get sharing their microbiome. And then all of a sudden you're like, hey, I can't wait to go exercise. You're like, I got really into it. I'm fit. It has it's nothing it's because it. you drink from the drinking fountain. Mm. You know, that's what happened. You, you, work, you went and worked out on that one piece of equipment where nobody toweled off. <laughs> that's what did it. That's the, So that's what they're doing at the gym when you got the athletes in there. Okay, nobody towel off. We want to make sure we spread this stuff. No, 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 no spreading. No, no, we're, we're not. Anyway, let's talk about the sixth, sixth th 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 sense, 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 sense. And I'm not talking about like the movie, not talking about I see dead, dead people. people. Yeah. yeah, no, no, not talking about ESP or not talking about ghosts and talking with dead people. And no. I'm talking about proprioception. That is really our one, two, three, four, five, sixth sense. So we've got the normal five senses, and then we've got the sense of where our body is in space. And I think I talked a little bit about a study related to this last week also, but uh, researchers at the Max Delbruck Center publishing in Nature Communications this week have been interested in the idea of the sixth sense, whose job it is to collect information from our joints and our muscles and our posture and where we are in space, and then tell our central nervous system about that. And it allows us to do things like navigate in darker spaces than maybe our eyes would normally allow us to do because you've become familiar with the layout of your house. Okay, so I'm I'm uh, I'm highly limited in my sixth sense then. <laughs> oh, I am the person who runs into doorways all the yeah. time. Yeah. Yes. But that's the thing. Some people are less able in their proprioceptive abilities than others. Some people do not really have proprioception. So if you closed your eyes and tried to take a sip of your coffee in the morning, would the coffee cup reach your mouth? <laughs> yeah, I, I think no it problem. would hit my teeth. I'm done. I usually, usually it like really? climbs right work. into my teeth. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, these researchers, they have published this art article in Nature Communications to better understand how what they are looking at, which are called proprioceptive sensory neurons actually work. And so these proprioceptive sensory neurons are located in the dorsal root ganglia of the spinal cord. And the dorsal root ganglia of the spinal cord, they're like the bottom part and they're a place where from the body, from all your muscles, all the nerves come in and they come into this little nerve center before they go into the spinal cord itself and then head up toward your brain. They're connected by long nerve fibers and they are attached to these muscle spindles which stretch when you move, Golgi tendon organs, which again, when the stretching happens, they go, oh, signal, 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 send it to the spinal cord and they're supposed to be registering all this movement, relaxation, tension throughout every muscle of your body. And they have to connect precisely because if they're not connecting precisely, then your proprioception is going to be off. And so they started looking for molecular markers that would differentiate 
certain pro proprioceptive sensory neurons for different parts of the body. So different neurons that would go to the abdomen, the back, your legs, your arms, and figure out what markers in the RNA are in there that are like, hi, I'm an abdomen proprioceptive sensory neuron. Oh, I'm, I'm, I belong to the back. Um, and they were able to show that these genes are active at the embryonic stage. They're active for a, a while after birth and that there are programs that move along uh, deciding whether or not they're going to actually innervate different parts of the body or not, whether or not these particular cell body sensor, the sense, the cell bodies of these sensory neurons decide to actually connect to stuff. Um, the idea eventually is that once they understand how these proprioceptive sensory neurons work is that when you lose the function of a limb, or even to give additional abilities to the function to the functioning of a limb, we can build prostheses that then could potentially connect to these proprioceptive sensory neurons in a much more valuable way, in a more effective way. So um, they can use light to turn, right now, optogenetics to turn these on or off in groups or individually, um, and they're able to get a lot more information about this stuff. But I have scoliosis. My spine is a little bit crooked. But I, and so this particular statement really kind of hit, hit me a little bit is that what one thing that uh, researchers in, in Israel have discovered is that if the proprioception isn't functioning properly, the skeleton isn't going to form properly. And so scoliosis possibly is a result of uh, improper proprioception during growth so that the proprioceptive sensory neurons are not necessarily acting in the right way to be able huh. to allow the spine so that there's even balance of the muscles that help interesting support the spine. And so that huh. the scoliosis it forms isn't necessarily only a disformation, a distortion of the spine itself, but also controlled by dysfunction within these sensor proprioceptive neurons. Mm. And so from forever, forever now on, this is why I'm going to blame every time mm. I, what I'm going to blame every time I walk into a door frame. <laughs> you should. <laughs> yeah. But the interest, the definitely interesting, um, aspect of this is the potential to be able to understand how our our nerves are connecting to the mm -hmm. various parts of our bodies and then um, how the signals are being transmitted along and how different cells decide that they are going to uh, connect or not connect where they connect and uh, what that means for the development of organisms and functioning bodily systems. Your sixth sense. So I haven't thought about sense. Yes. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about, about it in uh, at all in this sort of terms, but I have a what do you call it sciatica. Mm -hmm. uh, I get it, every once in a while I get a little bit of a lower back pain inflammation or something, and what happens is there's a nerve that's getting squished, it's getting mi mistreated right. somehow. Mm -hmm. And then the, the back muscles tighten around it because they're trying to protect that nerve. But by tightening, they're squishing it more and it's this vicious cycle. But anyway, right. the sciatica is runs down one leg. It's like a right. weird kind of a pain, but it's like just an irritating feeling. Runs down one of the legs. One of the things I've noticed is when that's acting up really bad, I, I sometimes will take a step or two and my, my foot isn't right. My foot like will be tilted in and it's like I need an adjustment or something. But uh, mm -hmm. I might uh, take a, a slight stumble when I walk, when I'm having this. But I never thought of it in this way. But it, what it, it could just be that nerve, pinched nerve, is now mistelling my foot where it is. Or mistelling yes. my brain where yeah. my foot is. And so it, yes. the, the foot's going out there like, there's no range problem with the foot. It's like, like not like it can't move in the right way. 
but it's just naturally, it plants itself slightly wrong. Maybe thinking that it's in the exact right place, but because of the distortion, because of this propria, the, the propria, what do you call it, sense? <laughs> the proprioceptive sense, yeah. The proprioceptive sense, proprioception yeah. is off. So it thinks it's doing the right thing, but it's wrong. And that's why when I stand up, sometimes that when I've got that back issue going on, that the first step is kind of wobbly because the foot's not planted right. That's really interesting. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot to be said for, you know, continued physical activity that is not just like, oh, I'm going to go just lift a bunch of weights or run as fast as I can. But actually, as you get older, focusing on very specific activities related mm -hmm. to stabilization and, you know, making sure your knees are uh, turned forward as opposed to splayed inward or outward, making sure that you are standing in a solid position on your feet, like making sure that you are telling the muscles in your body this is normal as opposed to letting just yeah. the deterioration of age kind of take over and then suddenly oh your foot is in that funny position is it like because mm -hmm. the question is is it in that funny position because we've been sitting in our chairs and doing computer stuff for too long and not doing very specific exercises to make sure that um our muscles are telling those sensory neurons the right things and maybe the sensory neurons are now confused about what's right and what's wrong. You know, so which way does that go? And, the, you know, and this gives interesting like interesting questions whole, about how. Whole, yeah. Yeah, a whole, this gives a whole new level to my thinking of what yoga is doing. Because there's so much what I call, I call like sort of muscle memory in terms of yeah. having done poses and, and, and stuff uh, enough times that you can, yeah, that, that strength and that core muscle, you think of all that stuff. But also training the body if you're doing very uniform physical tasks yeah. that are usually once you do it once on this side, you do it once on that side. It's probably building those conditions to that sense yeah. of where body parts are for all of these poses. You do them over and over again, and your body's getting better trained to know where all of those all parts and pieces of you are, are flailing about in the world. Exactly. Stop flailing. That's a even, You're not I've flailing. It's intentional, right? Yeah. Yes. Anyway, proprioception. It's important. It's, uh, I, I think this kind of information is going to be really interesting from these perspectives. How do we use this from understanding how certain developmental disorders occur? And then also... If you consider development all the way through into old age, how do we manage it and manage our proprioceptive uh, state all the way through old age to manage healthy aging as as we get older? A lot of people with sciatica. We 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 can do better. Oh than yeah, that, this, right. This, we can fix. We, that, come well, on, we can fix it. I don't know if they're gonna fix the sciatica. I got it right I now. I'm like standing like go, here. I don't like, want to go and get. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go and get like back nerve surgery or whatever, but it is, it's a, it's an interesting thought because it, I did not have this when I was doing a lot of yoga, which stretching, it could be all these other things it could be the back positioning adjustment, but I'm now just going to say it's the, what did you call it? The propecia sense. What is it? What's it? <laughs> Proprioception. Proprioception. Proprio. Proprioception. Maybe it's just proprioception is now like I haven't I haven't mentally worked out with my body enough lately. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Concentrating, mm -hmm. being mindful of where your body is in mm -hmm. space and how it's moving. Exactly. Noodles is saying as someone with neuropathy, I live this thought process every day. First priority is balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so we can train our brains for better body health. That's a great we, idea. Didn't yes, yes. Fantastic. Helpful tips that you can take with you at the end of this twist episode. We did make it to yeah, the end just a, now, didn't we? We made it to the end. We got a couple of them. <laughs> it's, it's, it's beginning to look like the mind and body are connected in some way. <laughs> it's beginning Mayhem. to look a lot like... Mind-body connection is important, everyone.
every single day. When you get up out of bed, you should think with your head about where you're going to put your feet today. Okay, that was the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We are so glad that you have all joined us. Once again, happy birthday to Blair and Justin. Thank you for all of your time and effort and I hope you had wonderful birthdays this past week. And for everyone else out there, it is time for a few shout outs. Shout outs to Fada, thank you so much for helping with show notes and social media, all those wonderful descriptions and things. Uh, additionally, Gord and Aaron Lore and others for helping to take care of our chat rooms. Everyone in the chats, thank you so much for being here, for chatting, for being a part of this conversation. We love seeing your comments as we do the show. That's what this is all about. Uh, Identity4, thank you for recording the show. Rachel, thank you so much for editing. There will be a little bit more of it tonight for, yeah, but not as much as there would have been if we'd actually started when I thought we started. And as always, time to say thank you to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazarb, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tozzi, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vigard, Chefstead, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Gaurav Sharma, Reagan, Derek Schmidt, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Gru and Bob, John McKee, Greg G Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Jaime Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Wert Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul Rick, Ramis, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Adam Mishkan, Sher Karen, not Sharon, Kevin, <laughs> Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Stephen Bell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul D. Disney, Devin, David Silmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you all for your support on Patreon. And if anyone else out there would like to support us on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. We do appreciate your patronage as it does help keep the show going. On next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific Time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. And do you know what next week's show is? It's the year in review, isn't it? It's the year in review! Yeah! Ooh, yeah! Ooh, wow. It's not just any old show. Ooh. Ooh, We're taking a, a look show. back yeah. at the top 11 science stories. Or so. Top 11 stories of 2022. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> while you're waiting for that, or after it airs, if you want to listen to us as a podcast, perhaps while you go over your year in review, just search okay. for This Week in Science over podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you have heard here today, show notes, links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. You can also sign up for a newsletter. You can contact us directly. Email kiki at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, justin at twistmanian at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into a dark room and we'll never find it because because we can't. It's it's lost. Because <laughs> Blair's bad it's at proprioception, and so yeah. am I. And it's yeah. just uh, it's done. <laughs> it's, it's gone. Gone. It's too dark. And can they still? Are we still on to Twitter? I gotta ask real yeah. quick because it says here that you can still hit us up. On, okay. Yeah, yeah we're, we're still, still on, on Twitter. Twitter. We don't know why, but we're there. Twist <laughs> science. Yes. Uh, do, at Dr. Kiki, at Jacksonfly, and at Chris Menagerie. 
We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week with the year in review, and we hope you'll join us again for more Great Science News. But if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science 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 science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten you for love Not trying to threaten anything at all we all we've got is an awesome lego made calendar by blair it's the after show bloop dee bleep dee blop blop blue and if you buy that calendar you'll have a beautiful year it i'm sure you'll have a wonderful year just because you buy the calendar how's everybody how's everybody it's all good oh we lost to justin Boop, deep, 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 bloop, bloop, bleep. I'm slowly fading into oblivion. We are all fading into oblivion. It is 10.46 p.m. here on the Pacific I, Coast. And I it cannot is remember late. when we've done a show that long. We have, well, we started It's been late. a really long time. It was, yeah, 2.20. It was a really fun show, though. Yeah. I do have to say it was a very fun show. That was even without a guest. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I I apologize for the very long show. Uh, Kind of, yeah. I mean, it is the end of the year. and This is the last real show of the year. Next Mm -hmm. year's... Oh, that's great. Next week's going to be... I just don't know how... I don't think I can stay. <laughs> I think I'm spent. <laughs> no, I agree with that. I'm spent as well. I have been spent. I actually, like, fell asleep earlier, <laughs> earlier today <laughs> and took a nap. I don't take naps very... I was like, I'm really tired. It's time for a nap. Thank you, Paul. I'm glad that you... Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's worth staying up for. I know you're on the West Coast. How many East Coasters are still up with us right now? That's what I... Oh, noodles, 1.46 a.m. Getting ready for... Yeah, (laughs) warming up for a marathon New Year's. That's right. That is right. I was just going to... I'm going to wait until Justin comes back so that we can actually say goodnight in the proper fashion. 4.47 p.m. Daniel Smith, you are obviously not on the East Coast. (laughs) She's fantastic. She's like, can we go to bed, please? (laughs) Sadie's like, it's bedtime. Why are you keeping me up this late? Yeah. Oops. My cats have given up on me. Totally given up on me. Yeah, I think I have weird energy tonight. Um... I realized that I get uh, monthly migraines, and so mm, east coast of Australia. There you are. There you are. So tonight, I uh, last night and tonight, I've I've 
tested taking a triptan. Mm. I, yeah, that's my, that's mine. That's my new rescue medication. It's great. It's changed my life. Yeah. And so yeah, earlier when I was very sleepy and was very yeah. unhappy and hiding under blankets, um, I took a trip in. Now I'm like, hi, everything's great. There's a huge really, euphoria. You're like, I'm really oh awake. My. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was in so much pain. I couldn't think or move. And now I it's gone. Do anything, and now I'm like, okay. And yeah. 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 That's basically so what good. happened. Oh, yeah. So, good. so, so that's, that's a new thing when you realize that maybe you've been dealing with monthly migraines as a, as a, a symptom of being a female for uh, oh, several sure. years yes. that could have been treated. Oh, yeah. No, I've been getting migraines since I was in middle school. And they kept saying like, oh, you need new glasses. Oh, you're wearing yeah. your hair too tight. Oh, yeah. you know, they always had a different excuse whenever I would see a doctor. Yeah. And yeah. then a couple of years ago, I went yeah. to a doctor. I was like, I'm pretty sure I have migraines. And they're like, let's talk about it. They go, oh, yeah, you have migraines. Let's get you some medication. I was like, medication? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. It's great. Yeah. The only reason this is this is a thing is because my husband has migraines as well. And he's like, he's been watching me. And he's like, you get, you've got migraines. I'm like, I don't have migraines. Leave me alone. This is, I just, it's just, I'm. I'm not happy once a month. I'm tired. It's fine. It's bad. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no. That's Look like a this. medical thing that's treatable. That's not just a headache. In fact, <laughs> like headache medications don't work on migraines. So, <laughs> no, they don't. Yeah. So it's amazing how much you can learn about yourself <laughs> as you as you grow older and find the right resources or mm -hmm. other people who are going through similar things. Once again, this is the, this is the stick with the others. Other people have knowledge that's valuable to you. It can help you out. Yeah. All right. Justin's uh. back. Say good night, Justin. <laughs> oh, that was quick. Good night, Justin. Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Good, good, good night. night. Kiki. Talk to you. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We will be back again next week. And oh my goodness, I can't believe Top it. Top 11 show. Uh, send us suggestions. Oof. What was your favorite story of the year? Top 11. We got to know. We got we to put the top 11 together. Oh, this is one of my favorite um, it's my second favorite show of the year, I think. I'm going to say right now that I I don't think I'm going to put the the National Ignition Facility story on my top. It's, it's top, but I don't wow. think top 20, maybe top 30, but I don't think it's going to be top 10 for me. Top 11, even. I might, I might go with one from we last week, to, just because I can remember. We got it. The, the, we I think the environmental it, DNA in Greenland. Is uh is one yeah. that's gonna make it. EDNA. That was pretty I huge. think yeah. Our and Laura saying Two the best story DNA. was from this week. I know it's the snakes, right? <laughs> I know. I Who know knew snakes had nipples? That's so such a strange takeaway. Justin, me, so. come oh. on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't purvey misinformation intentionally. That's not oh. our job. That's other people's job. It's still how I'm going to remember Misinformation. I don't know. Good night, everybody. See you next week. Yeah. Exciting show. We're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to uh, collaborate we have a, lot of work a little to bit do more than... next week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Everyone take care. Stay safe. Stay healthy, stay curious, and let us know what you think about the top stories of the last year. We'd love to know your ideas. We'll see you again next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time. Thank you for joining us once again. Good science to you all. <laughs>